You know, there's something about a ball field that stimulates all the senses. Fresh cut grass, the crack of the bat against that old horse hide, the smell of an old leather glove, like this one. This is a beauty. It's a 1940 vintage Rawlings, Mort Cooper autograph. Mort Cooper played for the Cardinals. I think he won like 125 games in about 11 years. And it's John McNamara's glove. He lives up in Millville. We're going to talk to him a little later. He's a great guy. Let me borrow his glove. This is indeed a prized possession. And the reason why we're here today is to talk about baseball in the Valley. And we're at McCoy Stadium, home of the Pawtucket Paw Sox. Now, they have a great season going for them. They're leading the league in all kinds of attendance statistics. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One, they have a great marketing department. Two, they got a wonderful baseball team. They're so far ahead of uh, all their competitors, it's not even funny. Third, they got an owner, Ben Mondor, who really cares about the game of baseball and really wants to make it affordable for the whole family. And finally, they're located right here in the Blackstone Valley. You got it right, Blackstone Valley, home of Mill Baseball, rival town leagues, semi-pro organizations. A lot of baseball players who had their dreams in the major found their way to the Blackstone Valley to play in one of those leagues just so they could capture their dream. Remember, work in the mills was no fun. And very often, any kind of diversion would be great. Plus, a lot of the workers actually were ball players, and pretty good ones, too. So we're going to talk about baseball here in the Valley. So we're going to hook up with a historian, Doug Reynolds, who's going to show us a little bit about mill life and baseball and how they kind of work together. We're going to hook up with a couple of old-time ball players from Millville who tell us how it was like to play in the mill leagues and a little bit about some of their friends who play with them. And finally, we're going to hook up with a gentleman who's going to tell us all about Walter Schuster great baseball fan and the motivating influence behind the establishment of the Blackstone Valley League. So folks, grab a glove, you're in right field. It's going to be a good game, so pay attention. Athletics, competition, and mill life have a long tradition here in the Valley. S social event, a way of releasing pent-up energy, those natural competitive instincts between rival companies, and also a way of Americanizing and controlling a diverse workforce. Baseball in the Valley had an important role to play. We're going to talk with historian Doug Reynolds, who was formerly with the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor, and today is with the Museums and Preservation of the State of Pennsylvania. And he's going to tell us a little bit more about the relationship between baseball and workers here in the Valley. Hi, Doug. Awful nice of you to stop by here from nice. Pennsylvania. <laughs> nice to see you, Chuck. One of the things that has caught my interest here is you're a historian. You're looking at the mills. How did you come up with a baseball connection? Well, I tell you, I was looking at some aerial surveys of the Blackstone Valley. and We all know that the rivers generally are the defining feature of the culture here. All our mills are next to the rivers, all our towns are next to the rivers, and many of our best landscapes are next to the rivers. But I also noticed that a lot of our baseball fields were also next to the rivers and, in fact, next to mills. And I got to wondering why so many of the mills had baseball fields next to them. So I started looking into it and discovered that there's a really nice baseball history here. It's got national significance, just like the mills, and it's got a national significant uh, baseball story to it, too. So that's kind of why I got interested in it. Now, mill life and baseball, how did it work together here? Well, it's interesting. You know, baseball and mills have a long, long history. that go way back into the 19th century. Um, you know, Providence had a World Series championship team in 1880. Um, and the industrialists everywhere, in fact, caught up with the baseball leagues by 1900. Here in the Blackstone Valley, it was really particular um, because the whole industrial system here was based on villages, not on big factories or on big cities on absolute villages and they, that was a decision made and um, it brought a lot of the luggage that small town life brings. So uh, mill owners I think found in baseball a way of both expressing the values of American culture but also in kind of bringing harmony and content to village life which you know sometimes could be contentious. Now we're here at the Berkeley Oval and the Berkeley Mill is right over in front of us right now. Um, 
And this is exactly the way it was laid out back in the 1900s. From my understanding, yeah, this is one of the best loved places in, in the Rhode Island portion of the Blackstone Valley for many of the old timers here. And the reason is they remember so well the nature of the ball games, a real cultural institution in this part of the, of the valley. Um, thousands upon thousands of people came here for games on, on weekends and during the week after mill work. People would probably don't realize that, you know, a typical ball game may have 4,500 people standing around. Is that correct? Yeah. In fact, a lot of times the delivery men would refuse to make a delivery to a place like Berkeley when they knew a ball game was being played. The reason for that, of course, is they knew nobody would be home to accept the parcel. Um, moreover, if the entire population of one village was absent, so was the other village that they were playing. So between uh, two villages like Berkeley and Ashton, you may get actually, you know, 4,500, 6,000, 7,000 people in the stands on a Saturday afternoon. Some of the old photographs show the uh, field like this just ringed with throngs of people. Yeah, um, Berkeley Oval had, had I think, about 10 high bleachers all the way down the sidelines, and people in the outfield would watch too. So it was really a popular, um, it's, it's hard to convey how popular it is really, but it was a substantial social event for the village. Now, the level of baseball play here was also significant because the quality was quite good. That's right. Um, it, one of the interesting things about Mill League Baseball in the Blackstone Valley is that it was so widely accepted by both mill owners and by village uh, residents that they expected and demanded a higher and higher level of play to the point where that often professional players were recruited or people on their way to the majors or major league players who were coming down. Um, a lot of college kids played. Um, and it was very, very good baseball here. Now, Doug, the nature of baseball here was very democratic. If you were good, you got a chance to play. Right. That's very important in these villages that are full of ethnic conflict. A place like uh, Whitensville, for example, where both Armenians and Turks live, uh, or in other places, as in Pawtucket, where you had both Irish and French Canadians, and, uh, of course, different Catholic churches to go with those groups. And uh, baseball, in fact, was a way of showing all the ethnic groups that it was pretty much your skill level alone that made you acceptable, your commitment to good play and to teamwork and to actual production that made you a part of the team, no matter where you were from or what language you spoke. It's very important in, a, in Mill Village life where ethnicity can be both a dividing factor and baseball, of course, to bring people together. The other aspect was you had a number of uh, ball players here from uh, the colored leagues, the black leagues. That's right, and even though a lot of African Americans didn't move to the Blackstone Valley until after World War II, they were regularly brought in to play, and um, it, it was almost integrationist at that level because they were seen as good examples of good hard workers and capable men who could actually produce on the field and generally run a good business life too because they were smart enough to, to get into the system and to be paid for their work and to move on to the next contract when they were able to. So a lot of values came out of this relationship between mill life and baseball, didn't it? That's right. Uh, baseball, we all know, is one of the, the great American institutions. But the question of what makes it a great institution is, is a separate issue. And I think it is, um, it's an acceptable pastime. It's, it's clean. It's natural. Um, as opposed to regular mill life, it's got open fields and grass. So it, it almost, in a lot of ways, calls up these democratic pastoral ideals um, of, of American history and American life. Well, Doug, this has been a, a great sitting here talking a little bit about mill life and baseball. And this is just the beginning of our, our show this month because we're going to travel to some more towns here in the Valley and learn a little bit more about some of the personalities who made baseball so exciting here in the Blackstone Valley. We'll catch you later. What's the connection between Pawtucket's colorful political past and baseball? Let's catch up with Ranger Jack Whitaker for a Blackstone moment and learn a little bit more about Thomas P. McCoy. Hi, I'm Jack Whitaker, National Park Service Ranger with the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor. I'm standing in front of Pawtucket City Hall, which may seem a strange place to talk about baseball. Well, we must remember that during the first half of this century, the two most popular pastimes here in the Blackstone Valley were baseball and politics. No one personified that more than the five-time mayor of Pawtucket, Thomas P. McCoy. Now, Mayor McCoy was mayor during the late 30s and early 40s, and during that period of time, he was responsible for building this city hall, 
as well as Hammond Pond Stadium, later to be called McCoy Stadium for the mayor after he had died. When the stadium was built, it was built on a swamp, Hammond Pond, and his critics were very quick to say that uh, it was a poor choice, that the equipment that was being used was sinking into the mud, that it was an unstable base for the field. But uh, be that as may, the stadium was built. It's still there today, although a recent addition uh, was turned down because of the un instability of the ground in right field. And they have a, a lightweight aluminum bleacher out there rather than the heavy concrete of the main ballpark. Remember that the Works Progress Administration, the WPA, has at a main function the employment of labor that here in the Blackstone Valley, over half of the labor force was unemployed. And the WPA from the Roosevelt administration New Deal was an attempt to build necessary structures, schools, libraries, city halls, town halls, post offices, and even baseball stadiums. Because it brought to the uh, locale where these structures were built the necessary funds to get the economy rolling again. This is Ranger Jack Whitaker bringing you another Blackstone moment. You know, while it's true that the mill owners did recruit baseball players to come in here to the Blackstone Valley and play, there was a lot of good homegrown talent that made an impression in the major leagues. Take Gabby Hartnett, for example. The first baseball game he ever saw, he played in. He was a catcher for the Chicago Cubs, and after 20 years, he found himself in Cooperstown in the Hall of Fame. His best friend, Tim McNamara, a pitcher, played for the Boston Braves for five or six years. Good ball player, grew up right here in the Valley. Well, today, we're gonna go up to Millville and meet with some of the guys who played in the old mill leagues, who knew Gabby Hartnett and Tim McNamara, and can tell us a little bit more about what it was like to play baseball. Hey, I got it, it's mine! Ugh. We're here in the Millville Library to talk a little bit more about baseball in the Valley. And we're fortunate enough to have with us Charlie Malai. And Charlie is, besides being a state rep for 18 years here in the Millville area, he was a really fine second baseman. And I rumor has it around here, Charlie, you had really soft hands. You could let, put the tags on the runners before they knew it. Is that true? No, I think they're confusing me with my father, who was one of the best baseball players in his day in the town of Millville. And John McNamara's uncle, who was a former pitcher for the Boston Braves, told me there were two fellows, in his opinion, that could have made the big leagues from Millville, Mike Tyne and my father, Charlie Mullally. Well, how come he didn't go on and try it in the big leagues? Well, back in those days, he had a family, and he was a bootmaker, and he worked steady, whereas he couldn't afford to just work in the summertime. Good point. The salaries back in those days didn't warrant that. Back in those days, uh, Chuck, uh, all the local town uh, teams had a baseball team. And uh, baseball was, uh, particularly during the Depression years, it kept the uh, kids occupied and the townspeople, it was some place for them to go to. Uh, we would pass the hat to uh, the, someone w w uh, for the team, and that was the admission, and uh, that helped us to buy baseballs and uh, the uh, bats and so forth. And back in those years, uh, the, the uh, United States rubber shop, because of the economy, the uh, depression, they all came here to watch the games. Uh, prior to that, uh, when the rubber shop was running in the, uh, prior to the uh, depression of 1929 and 30, uh, on a Sunday we'd get two or three hundred people, which for a little town, many times larger. Uh, and uh, there was a great rivalry between the uh, various uh, communities. And each one of them in their village had a, uh, a baseball team. And I can recall, we would go and the, uh, they had settees in the back of the truck. 
and we all sat there and we were very contented. And uh, sometimes after you beat a local team, you got rocked by them as you were leaving <laughs> by some of the younger people, <laughs> the I kids. See. And uh, however, it was a great deal of fun and it kept them, kept us all busy. Noble, for being a very small town, had some outstanding baseball players, you know, Gabby Hartnett and Tim McNamara. That, that's correct. Uh, Gabby Hartnett, uh, uh, I lived on Preston Street, which is, I can look out the window here now and see it. Mm -hmm. I lived at the top of the hill and he lived near the, the top of the hill, his family. And uh, he was, uh, of course, he's in the Hall of Fame and uh, Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown and that speaks for itself. But he, he was a great credit to the town because he brought it uh, recognition where a small town such as Millville, you, you don't get that much recognition. Um, and he had an outstanding career. He was a big, strong uh, fellow, 6'3", or t weighed about 250 pounds. And I'm going to uh, uh, tell you about an incident that I re that uh, happened to me in one of the trips that I took with uh, Milford Travel. We were down in Quincy in one of the restaurants uh, uh, where they were putting on a travel show, and a former member of the Boston Braves was there working, and I made his acquaintance, L.B. Fletcher. Now, some people, uh, particularly baseball fans, would recognize it right away. And he came from Milton, and he was the first baseman for the Boston uh, Braves and also for the Pittsburgh Pirates. And he told me an incident. They were playing at Braves Field, and Hartnett was the catcher for the uh, Chicago Cubs. And he was on second base, and the batter hit a, a, a long hit to right field, and the right fielder had to go out and, and uh, get the ball and retrieve it and get it to home base. And he said it was so far, he said, and I could run pretty good, and I was a big fellow. So he said, I thought, sure, I'd score from second base. He said, I w w ran round second base, all the way to home base, and he said, I just, I looked up and I was traveling as fast as I could, and he said, there was Hartnett with the ball. And he said, my only chance was to knock him over. Well, he said, I hit him as hard as I could, and he knocked me, he said, about five or six feet away, and he said, oh boy, he said, I didn't play for a couple of days, I got bruised <laughs> so badly. He said it was like hitting a stone uh, brick wall. And I can recall right over in the back of this present building that we're uh, sitting in, there was a billboard here on the other side where we parked our cars. And it was a picture of Gabby Hartnett endorsing Chesterfield cigarettes with his father pointing this particular day when someone took a picture of the father was saying, there's my boy. We're going to head over to the Rubber Shop Oval and meet with John McNamara, who's a nephew of Tim McNamara, a pitcher for the Boston Braves, and find out a little bit more about baseball in the Valley. We're here with John McNamara at the old Rubber Shop Oval here in Millville, a historic baseball field because it's seen how many generations of uh, aspiring major league ball players have played here, John? 300. <laughs> 300. <laughs> no, but everybody that's ever played here had aspirations, you know, because of Gabby and Tim. They really set the trend for everyone. Absolutely. Didn't they? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Now you happen to be the uh, nephew for Tim McNamara. Uncle who Tim. Grew up with my Gabby, hero. Your hero. Yeah. And uh, he was a great pitcher too. Oh, he absolutely was. My uncle Tim. Uh, Never played in the minor leagues. He went uh, until after his major league career was over. He played for Fordham. Uh, actually, Tim left here and went to work in uh, the mills in, in uh, Connecticut and played in um, 
some leagues down there, uh, uh, mill leagues, and uh, uh, he got a full scholarship to Fordham University, and he had some great years at Fordham. Uh, he was a teammate of Frankie Frisch's, who was in the Hall of Fame, and Tim went directly from Fordham to the Boston Braves, and he held a record for years. His first two games were shutouts, two to nothing and three to nothing, and he held that for 20 some odd years. He had some some great years. Uh, then he got on trouble, and um, he did go to the he went he was uh, uh, he went to the New York Giants from the Braves uh, because he had beaten the Giants so many times. McGraw bought him, <laughs> and then Tim got on trouble, and he was sent down to Toledo, and his manager at Toledo was Casey Stengel. Okay. And and they became famous friends. Yeah. If you ever saw Tim's scrapbooks and the letters he has from Casey Stengel, they became very fast friends. And Tim has some great stories about Casey. So, sure, Tim McNamara and Gabby Hartman, uh, uh, they're both like God to all the kids in know and to all of us all the time. Yeah. 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 Well, it, it's interesting you come from such a baseball-oriented family. Can you account for any of that? Why baseball was so big here in Millville? Well, there was not much else to do in Millville. I mean, uh, you know, the kids in those days, uh, uh, if they weren't sports-minded, uh, they went and picked blueberries or something, you know. But uh, I, I don't know many kids that weren't interested in sports, boys and girls, you know. Uh, and we'd come down here. I lived right up there. Uh, uh, they called it Bannigan City. Uh, it was named after Joe Bannigan, who built the old rubber shop that has burned down. And we'd come across the old red bridge right there and come down here and play ball at practically every day that, that you could, you know. Even if there were only three or four of you, you'd play a game of scrub or something. But everybody loved baseball. And of course, we had heroes of our own, like Charlie Mullally and the, and the, the fellows on the old Rovers, uh, who were absolutely terrific to me. And they encouraged me to play. They'd let me sit on the bench, be their bat boy. And sometimes they'd hit a ball in the river and I'd have to go shack it. I thought that was an honor, too. Worcester, Massachusetts has a long tradition of mill baseball. But for a brief shining moment, the second largest city in New England had a major league franchise. February 3rd, 1880, Worcester's dream was realized as it joined the National League. It wasn't until June 12th when Worcester's rookie entry into the National League made baseball history. The pitching sensation J. Lee Richmond, awaiting his graduation four days later from Brown University, faced Cleveland's ace pitcher, Big Jim McCormick. Worcester was allowed only three hits all day, but an era gave Worcester its only run. As for Cleveland, well, not a single runner reached first base. 27 men went up and 27 men went down. The senior from Brown had pitched the first perfect game in the history of professional baseball. Of the 12 regular season perfect games ever pitched, where the starting pitcher was also the winning pitcher, the very first perfect game was played in the fair city of Worcester, Massachusetts. We've looked at baseball here in the Blackstone Valley from the standpoint of some of the old players. We've looked at the standpoint of why the mills and the towns got so involved with baseball. The one element to our story that's missing, however, is the owners. And we're over here in East Douglas, a very small town in the right along the Massachusetts Rhode Island line. And we're going to learn more about the owner's relationship with baseball from Clarence Gagné, who happens to be one of the local historians on the Blackstone Valley Baseball League and who was actually the secretary and treasurer for a long time. Now, Clarence, why don't you tell us a little bit about Walter Schuster and just how he became such a mover and shaker in the world of Major League Baseball from such a small town like Douglas. Well, there's no question that Walter Schuster devoted practically all of his life, probably not from birth, but from age 15 until the time of his death in 1932. He was a, he was dominant in the baseball world of the Blackstone Valley. Everyone wanted to beat him which was likely because competition was high. Now that Mr. Schuster couldn't use Major League Baseball players on uh, the league team, he still took advantage of all his connections and brought a lot of those fine players up here in the Blackstone Valley anyhow, didn't he? I think we have to look at, at another side of Walter Schuster. He was a very generous person. He and a couple of partners gave the town of Douglas a new high school in 1925. He uh, brought his team uh, uh, for exhibition games to the uh, New England Fairgrounds in Worcester. 
Worcester Tech Field. He uh, went to Milford, a competitor in the league, and brought Nick Altrock, the great baseball comedian, in order to enhance the show, which was for the benefit of the Milford YMCA. There was constant generosity on the part of the gentleman, which I think led to uh, the fact that the so-called love-hate relationship was probably more love-envy. Uh, he had the money to provide these things, but he was always putting on a good show. He was constantly doing things of that kind, and, and people, I feel, after reading volumes of clippings and scorebooks from 91 on, that uh, people respected him. Major League players would play for Walter Schuster in Douglas uniform, but not in a league game. Uh, they would play in exhibition games. Uh, he had reached a reputation of having such a fine team that players from uh, all over the countryside would write to him and reach him somehow asking for a tryout with a Douglas team. This led to uh, many of the players coming from the colleges. And uh, they were eligible to play, and uh, as a result, uh, got their starts here in the, in the town of Douglas. A total of about 55 major league players played in Douglas uniform at some time or another. We sometimes lose sight of the fact just how hard and tedious working in the mills really was. And that's why any type of diversion that would bring family, friends, and fellow workers together was welcomed by all. And baseball was a great way to accomplish that. The intense rivalry between the different towns, the mills, was something to behold. Legendary, matter of fact. Unfortunately, that same sense of rivalry that everybody thought was great on a baseball field worked against these towns and communities later on after they suffered some significant economic downturns. That sense of rivalry prevented them from working together. And that's one of the reasons why the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor is here to kind of help facilitate coming together so we could all meet a common purpose and grow. Now we had a great time learning a little bit about the history of baseball here in the Blackstone Valley. It really has a tremendous history. But one thing I do want to question you about, don't let mom throw away any of your baseball cards. They could be really valuable. Anyhow, we'll catch you in the valley. <laughs>